Okay, let's make a start. Even, whoops. Even though we've got at least one extra person coming, but we'll start ourselves. I could just see Jan Barrett coming through the door. I will finish my um, PowerPoint presentation about the Industrial Revolution today. And on Monday next week, we will have the presenta student presentations uh, for the two classes. And then on Wednesday next week, we will begin our final topic. And I will send an email out reminding everyone who has not done a presentation yet that they must come on Wednesday and they must volunteer for presentations. Otherwise, uh, they will not get those points, of course. Um, depending on time today as well, depending on how long my final few screens take, there's something else I'm planning to do, which is more David as library director rather than David as history teacher, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, so the end of the last class, we were discussing the idea of Charles, ideas of Charles Darwin uh, and trying to put them into this context of industrial period thinking, these ideas of competition and progress and development and so on. <coughs> now, we have therefore a series of ideas about revolution, we saw with Marx, and reform, and I mentioned Mill as a kind of example of that, Europe had been changing during the uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries. We've been looking at that. We've been seeing the changes in particularly the economic and then the social structures. Okay? There had been big changes due to the industrial period. What had not happened so much was political change. Okay? Change in political structures were still fairly traditional, still fairly old. And in a sense, politics needs to change to fit the new system. To illustrate that, I have a cartoon here. Um, it's kind of vaguely based on my cartoon of my son, in fact. Uh, here is a little boy wearing little boy's clothes, and they fit him OK. All right, and that's kind of roughly how it should be. However, little boys tend to grow up to become big boys. And as they grow up, we need to buy them new clothes. We need to buy new clothes to fit the new body. Okay? But what's happened here, it's meant to be taller, in fact, I haven't done it very well. He's meant to be kind of taller. His feet should be down here, I suppose. Here is the big boy, but he's still wearing the same clothes that he had before, but they don't fit anymore. Look, his stomach is sticking out, his shorts are, uh, are too small, his toes are coming through the shoes and things like that, okay? And in a sense, what I'm suggesting is it was kind of similar with this. The economy and the society had, well, we can't say grown, well, they had grown, but we'll say changed. They had changed, developed. And if this is equivalent to the little boy's body, then politics is equivalent to his clothes. The politics needed to change as well. But in many ways it hadn't done. So what we have in the, say, roundabout 1825 to 1830, we could say, is something like that. Okay, Something where there has been changes, development, in this case getting bigger, but other things, the political structures, the way they organize the society, had not changed to fit in with the changes in economy and society. In society, remember, we talked about the development of the working classes and the middle classes as very important parts of society, industrial working classes and the capitalist middle classes. Whereas in many cases, these guys 
had little political influence. They hadn't gained the political power. They were the wealthy ones. The middle classes were the ones who were more and more becoming wealthy and powerful economically because they controlled the industrial economy. But they were not getting the kind of political power, for example, that they should have, or they, they, they believed they should have, in a sense. And so what we get during this period is a series of uh, problems, attacks, and concerns, and revolutions in Europe in the second half of the 19th century, partly at least because of this kind of situation. People are saying, we need to change. We need to change politics. The old system should go. So the first of these occurred in 1830. Does anyone know what happened in 1815? Very important date in kind of European history and beyond, in a sense. In 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated and lost power. Okay. If you know about him, we haven't gone into uh, the history of France in this sense in detail. We talked about the French Revolution very briefly in the last topic. Okay. They set up a republic. They got rid of the king. Gradually, however, we see the emergence of Napoleon Bonaparte as a kind of dictator. Okay. And he sets himself up as a kind of emperor, and he starts spreading the, the French empire elsewhere. So he's a kind of king figure anyway. So he subverts or changes the French Revolution. And he fights particularly against Britain, uh, okay, and eventually 1815 is defeated. Okay. And what they do then, what happens then in France with the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte, is they re-establish the monarchy. Okay. So, having not had a ruling king for 25 years, they re-establish the monarchy. Okay? So, in France, we have, by 1830, we have Charles X as king of France, okay? as the ruler of France. Now, what's happening is, in Europe in general, there is some economic and financial problems, okay. uh, and uh, a growing sense of social inequality. What does inequality mean? What does this mean, social inequality? Do you know what that phrase means? Classes. Right. What about them? Social inequality, what's the inequality bit? Okay, you've got the classes, so it's to do with the society. And what are they, what, what's the problem here, if it is a problem? Social inequality. Right, what are they doing? What are the aristocrats doing? Right, okay, yes, that's one possibility, and the door's not closed properly. Um, they have... Go on. Yes, okay. There is not the same spread of power. It's kind of what I was talking about before, okay. So in terms of social inequality, it means not just political power, but in general in society, people are saying, look, those guys have got lots of money and they're rich and we're not doing very well and things. They're feeling economically bad, they're feeling socially bad, as well as politically badly treated. Okay? And this is a general thing we, we see during this period. Despite the Industrial Revolution, particularly in Britain, okay, there is some economic problems going on. And what Charles is trying to do as we've seen before, he's trying to re-establish himself as king in a more absolute way. Okay? Maybe a bit more like uh, his uh, predecessor, Louis XIV, our friend with the legs that we've talked about before. So he's trying to re-establish uh, political power for himself 
okay, and assert absolute authority over the people, whereas they are feeling economically badly done by, socially badly done by. Okay, so he's trying to establish a, an absolute monarchy. The people underneath are not happy even with the current situation. So then we get a series of conflicts, okay, and especially the middle classes, the bourgeoisie, are very, very critical of the monarchy, okay, of the new uh, king and his monarchy. Eventually, for example, uh, he does various things including censoring the press. What is that? Do we know? If a government censors the press, what does that mean? Do you know that phrase? What is the press here? And we say the press in English. Newspapers, okay, because they used to press the ink down to, to print the newspapers. We could say media, because these days, of course, the press uh, publishes on the internet. It doesn't use physical pressing. But, uh, and censoring here, Thing, yeah, not allowing them to publish and things like that. The middle classes obviously were using newspapers especially to speak about their concerns, social inequality. They were saying it's not fair, we should have more power and they were criticizing the king. So eventually what the king does, as many rulers have done in the past, and we still have today of course, is that they say, okay, we'll stop the newspapers. We'll stop them having their voice in that sense. And then things build up, the uh, struggles uh, and build up, okay. They try and have some elections and the king tries to control the elections. Again, that happens today to make sure that uh, his supporters win. Uh, and eventually uh, we have in the summer, in July, there is a revolution, okay, in Paris and elsewhere. This is presumably a picture of the streets of Paris. And... Uh, Charles is removed as king, he's taken away as king, and his cousin, called Louis Philippe, is set up as a new king. Okay. And Louis Philippe, they believed, was a more liberal person. He was less interested in absolute power. He could be king, they didn't want to remove kingship yet, but they want to have someone <coughs> who is fairer, more liberal, who will perhaps deal with things like social inequality. And this is known generally as the July monarchy. Okay, so we have this outbreak there. So we have a shift from an attempt to be absolute to a more liberal and more constitutional system, similar to what we saw in England a few hundred years earlier, Okay, during the time of the uh, Restoration. We've mentioned that before. In addition to what's happening in France, in addition to, this is the big one, okay, and has massive change uh, for France in some ways, we see other uh, revolutions going on uh, during this year. For example, the Belgians, people who now live in what is Belgium, were... Uh, in fact, at that time, ruled by Holland, the Dutch, the Netherlands. Okay, it was part of that country. But many people in what is now Belgium felt that they should be separate. They were a different people, different language and so on, different history. They want to separate themselves from that. So there were riots and a little revolution going on in, uh, in those areas, particularly what becomes Belgium a bit later, to, uh, to try and break away from the Netherlands. And of course, they've got some problems these days in Belgium, if you read the news. I'm not familiar with the full details of that myself. So, let's say Belgians were also revolting at that time. Okay. In what is now the country of Italy, Italy didn't exist as a single country until uh, much later, okay? And at this time, 1830, there was no Italy, which was a single political country. And much of northern Italy was controlled by Austria, okay? And people in northern Italy 
in 1830 were revolting to try and remove Italian, con uh, Austrian control over, over them in the same way that the Belgians were revolting as well. And we also see riots in Britain and what is now Germany as well. Okay? So through a lot of uh, Europe, we see fighting, we see rioting, we see people criticizing uh, the, uh, the governments, we see people wanting to make change. The biggest and most effective of these was the one in France, as we can see here. But it, similar things happening elsewhere, part of a general problem. Let's have a look now at the constitution of the July monarchy. Can you all read that? Sado, is that legible over there? Can you read? No? Well, let's try and move this. If we can make it bigger or something, we might shift it back without causing any damage. We'll have to move it along, so it's going to be a bit bigger now. And I'll play with this. Can't get the whole text on, unfortunately. Um, I'll have to move it as we go along. Okay. Is that a bit better, a bit clearer? Yeah, okay. So, France, 1830, the constitution of the July monarchy. So they have a constitution. Okay, we said it's a constitutional monarchy. Um, and here are some uh, entries from that, okay, in the same way that we looked at documents from the uh, French Revolution before. French men are equal before the law, whatever may be their titles and rank. Okay. Social inequality we are talking about before. Here, the very first document is about social inequality. Title and rank, what is that referring to? What Jan Berg was saying before. Who have titles? Who has rank in a society? It's the... Rank means status, statue. Okay, here. People with title, it means things like count or duke. It's the aristocrats. That's why I'm uh, saying Jan Barrett. Okay. So whatever your title and rank is, okay, whatever you might be uh, in terms of your noble status, they're saying everyone has the same social uh, abilities in the law. Okay, the law does not say, well, the aristocrats can do this and the other people can only do that. Okay. So that was the, one of the big issues that they had, as we've seen, and that's the first one. They contribute without distinction in proportion to their fortunes towards the expenses of the state. And we've seen this one before in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. What's this about? What is this number two referring to? Any idea? Contribution. We've had that word already special use of the word to contribute. We had this a couple of weeks ago. Anyone? Number two is talking about what? Yeah, it's, uh, the, our question is, what are they contributing here? The first one is about social status, okay, and power, what you can and cannot do as a person. Number two, okay, what does fortune mean? If we talk about the English word fortune, well, yeah, production gives us something, it gives us... Hmm? Uh, okay, that's one thing. What's my fortune? Read my hand or my cave or whatever you do in Turkey. The other meaning of fortune is wealth. Okay, uh, if I have a fortune, it means I've got lots of money. Okay, um, so in proportion to their fortune. So that's the clue. What is this about? It's about money and contributing money. When do we contribute money to the expense of the state? What is this? When we give money to the state, taxes, okay? So like we had in the French Revolution, they're saying 
People contribute without distinction, there's no way of saying more or less, in proportion to their fortune. The wealthy people pay more, the poor people pay less. Okay, that's fair enough, isn't it? They've got more money to spare. So we shouldn't have to pay more if we're poor. Okay. So the first one is social, the second one, economic. They are all equally admissible to civil and military employment. So anyone can get a job. Okay. It doesn't matter what kind of uh, uh, position you are. So this is sort of job and social mobility. Their property, hang on, I'll get this up here. Their property is likewise guaranteed. No one can be prosecuted or arrested save, it means except, in the cases provided by law and in the form which it prescribes. Property is protected. That takes us all the way back to our friend John Locke, remember? Okay. And uh, you can only be taken to court according to the rules of the law. Okay. So law is important here again. Everyone may profess his religion with equal freedom and shall pertain for his worship the same protection. So the state is not favoring one religious, and here they don't mean things like Muslims, they mean different kinds of Christianity at this time, okay? But in theory, we could spread that everywhere. Everyone's allowed to, to believe what they want, okay, and, and be protected from that by the state. Frenchmen have the right to publish and to have printed their opinions while conforming with the laws. The censorship can never be re-established, okay? We mentioned that one before. Okay. This is again because the middle classes are supporting this monarchy. They don't want the press, the newspapers, to be controlled. And as long as we're doing something which is legal, which is not breaking the law, conforming with the laws, then we can say whatever we want. Freedom of religion and now freedom of opinion, expressing your opinion. So there they're setting up what they think is a fairer system. Okay, And again certain basic rights, certain basic things everyone has beyond what the government may do. Now what do they do for the government itself? The person of the king is inviolable and sacred. The ministers are responsible to the, hang on there's a mistake there, the ministers are responsible to the king alone, ah no, the ministers are responsible, to the king alone belongs the executive power. So it's still a monarchy, it's still focused on the king, inviolable Anyone know what that means? If something is inviolable? It means we cannot do violence to it. We cannot attack the king. Okay? The king is sacred. So they still have this idea that king's power is partly from God. Okay? The king is, a, is made king and God makes him into a king. You cannot attack the king. Okay? So they have some very basic old traditional ideas here, okay? And the king has the executive power, the final power to make decisions, and so, okay? But we'll see what else they come up with now. The king is the supreme head of the state. He commands the land and sea forces, military things, he declares war, makes treaties of peace, alliance and commerce, appoints to all places of public administration, and makes necessary rules and ordinances for the execution of the law, without the power ever to suspend the law themselves, or to dispense with their execution. That last sentence is very important. Without the power ever to suspend the laws themselves. So you have the king and you have the laws. And the king has to work with the law. He's not above the law. He cannot get rid of the law. Okay? The law is now very important. We've had that in the first part before. So the king does all these necessary things and he makes sure he's supposed to be the one who rules and makes sure that the laws work, but he cannot suspend, he cannot remove the law, okay? and, uh, and so on. So the king is not above the law, very important. The constitution is uh, set up so that there is the king and the law. The proposal of laws belongs to the king, the chamber of peers and the chamber of deputies. So the king and the chamber of peers, what would that be? Who are peers? Do you know what peers are? It means a number of things. It kind of means the lords, the aristocrats. There is one group, a chamber, a room, like in a parliament, Medjlis, the upper house, we often say, where the aristocrats will go and discuss politics. And then we have the lower house, the chamber of deputies, people representing you and me, ordinary people. So the king, but also 
the uh, representatives of the aristocrats and the representatives of the people work together to set up the law. Okay? It's not just the king. And very important point, nevertheless, every taxation law must be first voted by the Chamber of Deputies. It's the people who pay most of the money, so any change in taxation must be agreed to by the deputies, by the representatives of the people. Okay. So there are a few examples of parts of the constitution for the um, French uh, Revolution of 1830. Okay. It's not complete revolution, they're not getting rid of monarchy. Some of the basic ideas we've heard before, kings are sacred and so on, okay. The king is still a very central person, but he works within the law. He works with the law, he has no power to get rid of the law, and he has to work with uh, the representatives of the aristocrats and perhaps more importantly, the people, okay. So here is one example of violent change that made a, quite a big change to the system, okay, uh, a big step uh, at that time. They did a slightly different thing in England, okay. Now in France what they did is in a way they gave this boy some new clothes. They said, okay, you've grown up, we need to give you some new clothes. Let's completely change your wardrobe. Let's go out shopping Saturday afternoon, go to Tanala Hilmi and buy you some nice clothes, okay, that fit. So that's what they did in France, okay, and there was some fighting first, but that's what they did. What they did in England was they also had problems, they also had pressure from uh, people, particularly people were asking for parliamentary reform to change parliament, it was something that was going on. What they did there is they said, all right, okay, let's, we'll buy you a new t-shirt. Okay, we'll get you a new t-shirt, but we won't think about the trousers. We'll just get you part of what you need. So they did little changes to keep the minimal change to stop the violence happening. Do you see? In France they had violence, they have a big change. In England they made enough change so that there would not be violence in a sense. They didn't have a massive change in that way. And this particularly focuses on what we call parliamentary form, changing the way that Parliament was organised. England's Parliament, in a way, can be taken all the way back to the Middle Ages, okay, back to like the 13th century. The 13th century Parliament was very different to the one that they had in the 19th century, one we have today, but you can kind of trace the history back there. So it's quite an old institution. And it had been slowly changing and developing over a long time. Sometimes the kings had parliaments, sometimes they didn't, but parliament, particularly for a few hundred years, was, had become more important and more powerful. What we've seen, however, is that since the 18th century, English economy and society was changing in a very big way because of the Industrial Revolution, which kind of began in Britain. And the parliament was still Re reflecting older systems. The Parliament was definitely like this. Okay? It wasn't showing the new society. It didn't have representation for working classes and middle classes. I'll give you a couple of examples. One example is something that is now referred to as rotten boroughs. Boroughs were what? Do you remember what we said? We had that word a few weeks ago, a borough. Anyone? Cast your minds back, look in your notes. A borough, town, okay, or city, something like that. Okay. Maybe 400 years earlier, There was a small borough. Okay, we'll call it Hidjivborough. Okay, and Hidjivborough uh, was middle-sized. wasn't very big. wasn't a big town 400 years ago. And the system was that because it was a middle-sized 
uh, town, maybe it could send two MPs, two members of parliament, to the parliament. Whenever the king wanted a parliament and needed to discuss taxes or something else, he would say, let's have a parliament, and then they would go around the country, and obviously from Hidjivborough, they would say, okay, we'll send our two representatives, Jan Berwick and 2J will go and be our representatives in London. Okay. If it was a bigger borough, they may have more or something. But this is, this is Hidjiv borough here now. However, this is 400 years ago. Now, because of economic changes, social changes, whatever it might be, Hidjiv borough is a lot smaller. One house. There's only one house left. It's still called Hidjiv borough. It's in the same place that the old town would be. But the houses have collapsed. People have left. They've gone and lived somewhere else. Okay. But on the documents, in the pieces of paper, there is somewhere called Hidjiv borough, and it's meant to send two MPs. So we have a new parliament. Time for a parliament. And uh, there's no one there. No one can come. But technically, uh, they should be. And maybe they'll choose a couple of people and say, okay, they can represent Hidjiv borough, even if there's only like two people living in that place. Meanwhile, 400 years ago, I'll choose Leeds because I support Leeds United. Uh, 400 years ago, Leeds was a small village, Kui, okay, in the north of England. Nothing going on there. Unimportant. So, no MPs. No one comes from this small village called Leeds in Yorkshire because it's just a small village, not important. Now, however, Leeds has become a very big industrial town. Okay? It's got factories, it's got lots of people living in it and so on because of the Industrial Revolution. But still, there were no people coming from Parliament. Because it says that on the paper. Okay, that's how it was arranged 400 years ago. They haven't changed that. So Hidjiv Borough, with hardly anyone living there, sends people, and they've got nothing to do with Hidjiv Borough. They're just chosen by someone else. Leeds, however, where a very big population of people has no representation. There's no one coming to Parliament to say, this should be done because this is what we want from Leeds or Manchester or somewhere. So rotten boroughs, rotten means what? If something is rotten, small. not small. Rotten, rotten apple. An apple, if you leave an apple for four weeks, it will just start to disintegrate, go bad. Okay? It means here bad, a bad borough. This is a bad borough. Hidjiv borough is bad because it's sending people to parliament, but in fact there's no one living there, or hardly anyone living there. Okay? And there were lots of these, especially in the south of the country, okay, where things have changed, people have moved on, and things like that. But they haven't changed that. So there were lots of complaints about rotten boroughs. There was also a lot of corruption in the ways that elections were made. Let's take that one as... For example, let's take one example. At that time, if people were electing, choosing someone to be their MP, okay, like we have today in England or we have in Turkey, we elect people to represent us in Ankara or London, at that time they had what we call the open ballot system. Do you know what that means? Open ballot? Today we have, in most countries, closed ballot. But then elections were done with open ballot. Now open, well it is a list, but what happens to that list? When you go to choose to go and elect, I'm not allowed to elect in Turkey because I'm a foreigner. Nobody sees. Okay, You go somewhere, I don't know how it works here, and you have a list of, of people you want to choose, and you choose your one, Okay, close it up, and put it in a box or something. It's the same in, in Britain. Okay, 
closed, it means no one can see. You've closed the paper, it goes in. No one knows who you've chosen. At that time, it was open. People could see. Okay? They kind of didn't think there was a big problem. We think of it as bad from our perspective, but it wasn't a big deal. Now, the problem was, imagine, okay, imagine we're in a, a town or, or a, a village or somewhere. We're going to be choosing an MP from this area. And you're all the people that live there. And you, you're not very poor. You've got enough money to allow you to, to vote. Okay, because at that time you had to have a wealth thing. Only the men could vote, by the way, so you'll have to be men for, the, for this example, ladies. Okay, Jamberg's okay. Uh, men could vote, and if you had enough money, if you owned a big enough house or something, then you were allowed to vote. Poorer people were not allowed to vote at that time. And it carried on like that for a while longer. In this case, you're all going to be voting for someone. Now, I am the local landlord. I'm the local powerful man, Lord David. Okay, I'm Lord David, here I am. I'm coming along, and I'm, I want, here are the two candidates you're choosing. Okay, I'm particularly friendly with this guy, the black candidate, Mr. Black. Okay, in fact, he's married to my daughter, okay, and so I want him to go to Parliament. I don't really want the red guy to go to Parliament. Most of you are living on my land, okay, or you're connected to me in some way, and this is my area. And it's open ballot system. So who are you going to vote for? If you're not stupid, you're going to vote for Mr. Black. Because if I find out that you voted for Mr. Red, then I might say you can't live there anymore. Things like that. Okay. So from our perspective, that is clearly a corrupt thing. Okay? It's not a, a nice way to do elections. And people at the time were beginning to realize that they needed to change that system as well. And there were other things in addition. So what happens is there's some growing pressure, some growing demands uh, on the government to change the parliamentary system, to have some reform. Many people hated this idea. They said, we've had this for hundreds of years. It's kind of working. Let's not change it. Okay? Others said, look, if we don't do something, we're going to end up like the French. Okay? We're going to end up with some kind of revolution. Let's make some concessions, particularly to the middle classes. We don't need to worry about the working classes too much. They're just kind of poor people or whatever. The middle classes, they're the ones with the economic power. They're the ones that can do something to us if we don't change that. Okay? So they're the ones we need to take into account. So that's what they did. They made some changes. Not massive change, not complete change to the English electoral system, but some change. And here we have another acetate which quite nicely, if I can get it all on here, and we can't get it perfectly, I have to keep moving it, okay, um, uh, reflects that. So here's Lord Macaulay, okay, who was a famous politician at the time. He wrote some history books as well. And he gave a speech about the Reform Act, the Reform Bill, that they were making to try and change things. Okay? And here's his opinions. Firstly, what it's doing for the middle class, and secondly, what it's doing for the working class. Okay? And this is a typical opinion of many of these people. And he was a famous guy. He uh, uh, re reflects the basic ideas. So the details of this bill, so this bill, uh, the, the principle is plain, rational, and consistent. What this bill is doing is very clear. He said, what this act, this change is doing, and it is this, to admit, to allow the middle class to a large and direct share in the representation without any violent shock to the institutions of our country. So let's give some representative power to the middle classes. Those factory owners in Leeds, not the working class, the factory owners in Leeds who own a lot of factories, they're very important people economically, okay? Let's give them some power, but let's not make big change. We don't want violent shock, we don't want a big change to our institutions. The end of government, the purpose of government, is the happiness of the people. Okay? What government should be doing is making people happy. And I do not conceive, I do not believe, that in a country like this, the happiness of the people can be promoted by a form of government in which the middle classes place no confidence. So if the middle class is not happy with the government, then the country is not happy. We need to keep the middle class happy. Uh, okay? And which exists, the government exists only because the middle classes have no organ, no way, by which to make their sentiments known. We need to give the middle classes some way of sharing in the power, of saying this is what we want. 
But, sir, I am fully convinced that the middle classes sincerely wish to uphold the royal prerogatives and the constitutional rights of the peers. I don't think the middle classes want to get rid of the king and they don't want to get rid of the aristocrats. They want to just join us and have power themselves. Okay? So that's what he believes is going on. And what about the rest? What about the majority of people? What about the working classes? I believe that there are societies, there may be societies somewhere, in which every man may safely be admitted to vote. It doesn't say women there, whether they mean people, we're not sure, but I suspect it doesn't. So maybe in somewhere in the world, we can let everyone have a vote. Okay? I say, sir, that there are countries in which the condition of the labouring classes is such that they may, may be safely entrusted with the right of electing members of the legislature. In some places, even the workers, even those idiotic, stupid working class with the bad skin and the backs we were talking about, we can give them the He says, maybe somewhere. Don't know where, maybe somewhere. Okay. If the labourers of England were in that state in which I, for my soul, wish to see them, and I would like the, the working class of England to be like that, okay? if employment were always plentiful, if wages were high and food was cheap, if a family were considered not as an encumbrance but as a blessing, okay, the principal objections to universal suffrage would, I think, be removed. Universal suffrage here means letting everyone have the vote. Universe is everything. Okay? Here again, I suspect he means men rather than women. But okay. If the working class in England were different, then we could let them have the vote. But clearly he thinks they're not. Okay. Universal suffrage exists in the United States without producing any very frightful consequences. In America, the poor people can vote, and nothing very bad is happening there. Okay? And I do not believe that the people of those states or any other part of the world are in any good quality naturally superior to our own countrymen. They're not really that different. But unhappily, the lower orders in England, the working class in England, uh, and in all old countries like France, are occasionally in a state of great distress. Okay? They have problems. For the sake, therefore, of the whole country, of the whole society, for the sake of the labouring classes themselves, I hold it to be clearly expedient I think it is necessary that in a country like this one, the right of suffrage, of voting, should depend on a pecuniary qualification, money. Okay. If you've got enough money, you can vote. If you don't have enough money, you can't. Pecuniary here means money. Every argument, sir, which would induce me to oppose universal suffrage induces me to support the measure which is now before us. So he's saying the bill, the act of parliament that we're doing, okay, should not allow everyone to have the vote. I oppose universal suffrage because I think it would produce a destructive revolution. I think it would change everything. I support this measure because I am sure it is the best security against a revolution. So here is someone, a lord, one of the top guys in the country, okay. He recognizes they need to make changes. The changes they are making is to give some power to the middle class. If we give these guys power, that'll be enough. Let's not do the working classes. If we let the working classes have the voting, if the poor people, or the poor men, I should say, can vote, then what they will do is vote for some big change. Okay? Not violent revolution, but they will vote in things that will change things in a big way. The middle classes are happy with the king. The middle classes just want to join the aristocrats and have power. So let's let them do that, but let's not have the working class because they are in distress, they have some bad ideas. Okay, change that. So that's what they did. So to take the example of my cartoon again, as I said, they didn't make a big change. They didn't change things completely. They didn't go to Tunala Hilmi and buy the big boy completely new big clothes. What they did is they changed a few things. They changed his t-shirt but they left him with the same shoes and shorts that he had before. Okay, that comes later, the next 50 years and so on. Gradually they'll change that. But it was enough. It was enough to make sure there was not a revolution like they had in France. Okay. So that's two approaches. You either have a big revolution, change things completely, or you make a little change, just enough, let the middle classes in, and they're the ones with the economic power, and then things will carry on pretty much as they were okay, before. 
Okay, well, I've still got two screens left, so I haven't finished there. Let's have a break, 10 minutes, and then we should look at 1848, and we shall have a little look at what happens in Russia. Okay, thank you.